Okay, so in the Paleolithic and the Old Stone Age, man was constantly on the move, hunting, gathering. After some time, man would find water. Man would find a place that they could regularly get water and perhaps rest, gather. Um, they could make a hunting camp and hunt from there, always coming back to there. And with that regular source of water, they would see animals come as well, and it would be easy to find other places, other people that are associated along the water. And so these groups of people would form settlements, settlements would turn into villages, and villages would turn into cities. And we're now looking at the ancient Near East. Uh, a couple of these peoples in the beginning would be more uh, Neolithic than ancient. Believe it or not, there was a time before ancient. Um, that would be the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. And here's an example of Neolithic work, another Venus-type figurine. Notice that the posture is similar to what we've seen before. Accentuation has been given to the belly, the heavy thighs, the breasts and the arms are crossed again over the front. The head is missing, and we don't quite know if those are cankles, if those are feet, or if that's just you know, the feet got cut off. It doesn't look like they were broken uh, so much. I don't see. Do I have it here? I have it somewhere, but we're not going to spend a great deal of time talking about this particular Venus figurine. I simply wanted to have something to talk about with the Neolithic, showing how man's techniques and sculpture was improving, being refined. As well, we have several uh, words worth uh, remembering here. Load-bearing construction, for sure. Uh, steely, or steel, ziggurat. Uh, convention. Column. Uh, cuneiform. So, uh, these would be some of the more important, oh, and intaglio for sure, intaglio, intaglio, I'm not going to judge you in how you pronounce it. Um, so we move now to a Neolithic people, and the first of which, some 10,000 years ago, so 8,000 years BC, 2,000 years AD, 10,000 total, we'll look at the first, uh, one of the earliest cities of Jericho, 7,000. Um, some of you might have might have heard of the city of Jericho because of its famous walls which would go tumbling down and what we found from this city was really fascinating besides the architecture well first off the architecture five feet thick and 20 feet tall okay so 20 feet tall for that time imagine how much time it would take clay mud mixed together dried in the sun and then stacked five feet thick Obviously, a spear is not going to get through that. Um, I'm not even sure if a 308 from a rifle would get through that. Um, but, obviously, those kinds of walls would, would have been impenetrable at the time. 20 feet tall. Imagine the biggest thing you've ever seen in person, made by man. From far away, this would have been impressive, and, and would have uh, fostered a certain amount of hope and faith in that structure. You would have wanted to have lived in that city, and the protection it afforded. So that's you know just kind of a rough idea we could have we can learn from the sculptures, rather the the architecture of it. But something else that we've discovered within Jericho, as well as another settlement uh, in Turkey, Katal Huyuk, are the the practice of putting death masks over the dead. So what does this imply? Does it imply that, you know, the, these were important people? Mm, maybe. Well, obviously they were important enough to spend the time doing that. Um, do we still do things like this? Yes, we do, but really more for special effects. But in some cases, up in, even until the 19th century, there was, an, there was a, a, a drive or a need or a demand to make uh, busts and preserve the facial appearance and sculptural form of a person's face. Here, though, if you look at the book, it seems to be more associated with preservation of the dead and ancestor worship, a way to preserve the memory. Uh, to keep them looking beautiful or looking something like how they looked in life, or to preserve that for the afterlife. The, these are things that we could glean from them. Understanding, though, that some of these cultures were pre-literate. We don't have any uh, literature to you know, kind of glean whatever we can from them. 
at Katal Hugyuk, we can see again uh, worship, and this isn't necessarily a piece directly from the book, I just want to give you an idea of as to how Neolithic sculpture was improving at the time. At Katal Hugyuk in Turkey, they venerated uh, bulls, they venerated bulls, and you'll see that bulls pop up throughout the region uh, as well. Uh, female figurines, mother or Venus figurines becoming less prominent, more towards men. But in this very dynamic sculpture, you can see a Venus type figure seated like a queen. Uh, this is the original piece. This is a reconstruction and interpretation. We can still see that she has a kind of leonine partner on both sides. Can't quite tell if it's a dog or if it's a lioness, uh, but you can see that the, there are beasts at her sides. What would that imply? Would that imply that she has mastery of them? Would that imply that she is one of them? Or what have you? Now, uh, along with along with agriculture, along with changes in culture, we have uh, something new that was probably discovered by someone, you know, sitting by one of these rivers. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, along with many people, I, I usually ask my online classes if they do this. You ever just sit, when you're sitting by the river or sitting at the lake, do you ever draw in the sand? Obviously, several people raise their hands. I raise my hand as well. Well, uh, think about it. Think about who was the first person to sit there. They're drawing in the sand, and then someone comes along and says, Dude, what are you doing? Well, I don't know, just drawing. And then they take a look at that, and they think, Wow, well, that kind of looks like a duck. And he goes, oh, yeah, that does look like a duck. And so these two people, they start a conversation. They start saying, well, ma well that's soup, you know, and here's the recipe for good soup. you got to do this, 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 and this. you got to get the grain for the soup. you got to cut up the carrots, tomatoes, and so forth, and then you've got a really good soup. And so these two, they have their own little private language, but eventually more people come along. Oh, dude, what's that? And, and so, because it's clay, that clay can be dried, it can be fired, and they could take it with them. And eventually, more people would see it. And so, up and down the river, language can be traded. And thus, language is formed. This earliest language is cuneiform. And notice the similarity there. It had to start somewhere. It had to, it, it took, you know, it took just one person to start and then other people to exchange. So you cut into the clay or you cut into the rock, this technique of intaglio, intaglio. Now we have a new tool for visual communication and that is the abstract language of writing. This of course would come from Akkadian culture of which Sargon I is famous for helping to start. Um, we, we, we move now to new opportunities because it's not just uh, it's not just art and uh, okay hold on a second it's not just art without images I mean it's not just images without words anymore but images themselves can be added to the art Im images that are words. Words can be combined with, it took me a second there, <laughs> words and images can now be combined and we have a brand new tool for communication. This tool is used here in the stele of Naram Sin as well as the stele of Hammurabi. Whereas before it would simply be a relief sculpture, very intimidating, very powerful, but now we can tell an even greater story. Uh, in the image you see Naramsen standing proud, tall, above so many others. Now, for one, he's the largest, so he must be important, right? And he's the tallest, he's the highest up on the page, or, well, the stone. So that doubles his importance, or makes him, you know, reminds you that he is the most important. So this is something called hierarchical proportions. The hierarchy is determined by the proportions of the different things there. So because he's the largest, because he's the highest up, hierarchical placement would be placing it higher up. And so because of this, we know he's the most important. 
following the canon or the conventional practices of representation, convention, canon, these things agreed upon, a com agreed upon style, or in this case, a visual cues and a visual language, uh, show his right side prominently, the strong side. Uh, notice he holds the spear, and before him is a man with a spear through his neck. Dead. Now, what's behind him? People in a similar pose. Whereas before him, you have people kind of coming and going. You have chaos, diagonal movement. And I'm going to get kind of focused on design here for a second to explain my point. This is propaganda in a way. One, it's showing his power. And two, it's showing that he brings order. What is behind him? Repetition. What is behind him? Strong vertical lines. Vertical lines communicate strength, solemnity, stillness in some cases. Well, horizontal lines, more stillness than anything. Before him, diagonal lines, chaos, movement, um, the potential for even more movement. And above him, stars. The stars shining down. And what's before him? A single person preaching, screaming, praying to the heavens uh, for mercy, speaking of his might. Now, could that have been done without the text? Yes. The text now serves as a way to reinforce that image. It now serves as a new tool to communicate directly uh, what is needed. So this could be one of the earliest comics as well. Um, on the right, the Stele of Hammurabi, art uh, kind of is supplemented, rather here on the left one, the writing supplements the art, whereas on the other, the art supplements the writing, because writing here is meant to uh, describe, it's meant to um, not entertain, but intimidate or record, whereas on the right, the writing takes the forefront because it is meant to dictate, it is meant to educate. Uh, it is, of course, the laws, the rules of Hammurabi. And above it, you see Hammurabi getting these laws from a god h higher than him. It may not seem like a big deal, like he's not very much higher, but he is. And we see this because of the pedestal and because of the hat is slightly taller. You could even, if you thought about it, or if you looked at it a little longer, you'd realize that this person is much taller than Hammurabi as well. So hierarchical placement and hierarchical proportions take uh, take the front seat. And so even from far away you see the sculpture, you see the people, and then as you get closer you finally see the writing and the rules, the laws of the land imposed by Hammurabi. Now this new tool, writing, and believe me it is a tool um, we don't quite see it as an art form yet. There's no bold, there's no italics, uh, there's no dime store novels or harlequin novels just yet. It's, it's a tool to communicate. And they would, they would write in different ways, whether by incising with cuneiform or by pressing into the clay and then letting it dry. This is a hymnal. Uh, for those of you that don't attend church per se. Um, <clears throat> a hymnal is a book which contains songs for people to sing in a group during a worship service of sorts. So since books didn't exist at this time, they would pr print or press into the clay on all the different sides and put this in the middle of the room so everyone in the room could read it in the round and thus sing their songs. Really rather ingenious. Now, getting to sculpture, convention, there's the word I had mentioned before, agreed upon style of representation, a principle. Um, and in these sculptures, you see that they share similar traits, their posture, their body language, their style, all the eyes are wide, um, all the heads are straight up, looking forward. They look like servants. Um, if you could look to the book, you'll see that uh, the sculptures here are part of a collection, uh, appearing to be worshippers, holding a cup, ready to accept 
you know, what have you. Uh, if you're curious, this was actually supposed to be a child. Uh, there's a mother and child there. Uh, and so, just like with writing, you know, people, you know, whoever was writing the first, or drawing the first letters and playing around in the clay for the first time, they had to be agreed upon. And whatever writing or whatever things were agreed upon, say, uh, in Asher, had to be agreed upon later. And so maybe they had different styles in Nimrud and different styles in Babylon and Ur. But it took a group to agree upon those things. And so later on, a ruler would establish you know, what is to be used and how it is to be done. Here we have a very different type of ruler. Whereas Naram Sin uh, reinforces his strength through hierarchical proportions, uh, through the telling of a tale, uh, Gudea communicates his power in a different way, and that's through simply body language. Yes, there is a tale and there is uh, words included in the sculpture, but if you look at um, his body language, it communicates a different kind of leader. Um, looking forward, engaging, but still slightly above the pedestal, and we take these things for granted. We don't think that big of a deal. We don't think it's that big of a deal, but a conventional uh, element in sculpture at this time was to place gods, kings, those in power on a pedestal or have them on a chair. And even though we take that for granted, chairs were quite a big deal. The chair has not always been around. Someone had to invent it. And this is one of the earliest examples of a chair. Uh, moving on to sculpture and relief, here we have another reinforcement of that idea of power. We have the lion, a symbol of power, a symbol of fear, a symbol of nature's might. But here we have man uh, domineering, uh, dominating nature itself. So how powerful is this ruler? Well, he is free to hunt while his servants control beasts, which show mass shows mastery over the beasts, but those beasts themselves conquer the wild, uh, powerful, fearsome uh, lions themselves. The hunt can be seen, the arrows quite clear, and I just want to take a moment to zoom in so you can see some of the detail here. Um, just a moment. Okay, now that you can see this up close, you can see the detail, and imagine how much time it took. This was a profound dedication of time and wealth. Someone had to set aside days, weeks, to carve this out for their ruler. So that alone says something else about how much money, uh, how much power, how much influence he had over people to make these kinds of things done. And what is this from? Asher. Um, please remember that this chapter covers several civilizations, and this is Asher Nashapal. So, uh, we've gone from Jericho to Katalhyuk to Acadia to, well, Turkey, Iran, going back to the map, here we go. So, we started with Jericho, we've jumped around from Asher, Babylon, and... Uh, we continue now with works of sculpture and Ur, the great ziggurats. So what are ziggurats? We've looked at sculpture, we've looked at drawing uh, to an extent. I, I, I consider this kind of like drawing because, well, okay, moving on. That's a whole other conversation. We'll look at architecture now with the ziggurats. Ziggurats were, for all intents and purposes, holy mountains. If you've ever driven through West Texas, Kansas, some of those flat states, you can remember the feeling of just driving along forever and seeing nothing. And then you see that one gas station, that travel stop, and the lights of it shine or the sun catches it, and you just, you cannot not see it, but it's still so far away. Imagine the landscape here. You have traveled far you still don't see much of anything and then you see this white light or this white thing on the horizon and a bump on the horizon as well that would be your holy mountain this is ziggurat this was made through a type of construction new uh new for us the first type of construction being post and lintel this new type being load bearing in which the base 
is wider the building is wider at the bottom and this wider bottom holds the next layer above and the next layer above is smaller and smaller and smaller this is how we get buildings like the pyramids and of course the ziggurats when you look at the line here in the diagram it's easy to see how it works and this is the original design of it now atop this particular ziggurat would have been a temple a shining white temple now this shining white temple would have been easily seen from miles or kilometers away capturing the eye and inspiring those that are before it because this was for many no doubt the largest building the largest creation they'd ever seen outside of nature so it would have had an awe-inspiring intimidating life-changing experience to it or life-changing quality to it and here we see an alternate view with the landscape in the background pretty desolate obviously the steps up to the white temple now there are multiple ziggurats and this is just one I'd like for you to see another ziggurat one more intact made by uh, more stronger bricks perhaps you can see the long leading lines up to the top the processional stairway up to the top and just to give you a sense of perspective I'd like for you to see a person to see how small they are in comparison not very small at all not very small at all are they one thing you need to take into consideration though uh, while man uh, here is the man we think of it's still rather a uh, very small man 10,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago man was still quite small in comparison to what we have now they weren't as small as Paleolithic man but still rather small so load-bearing construction provided uh, really new opportunities for wealth displays of wealth displays of power security and prosperity and believe me this is a far cry from what we had at Jericho especially when you take the time to look at the dates associated with these buildings so man had to have, so man has discovered agriculture has discovered irrigation has discovered writing and discovered ceramics the firing of clay in kilns those hot hot ovens um, they can take those clay bricks they can fire them in the ovens or dry them in the sun and they can decorate them and this the Ishtar gate from Babylon is one of those examples just just really use your imagination for a minute say you're a goat farmer and you've lived in this region you fought tended to goats lived in the village and the biggest thing you ever saw was a cow I mean even if you had a cow or a large goat you never saw anything really much bigger than a hut so now it's finally time to go to the city or for some reason you need to go to the city this is the first thing you see well, not even that you see the the grandeur and the size of the city itself it's bigger than anything you ever imagined and then you come up to this you see color you see these beasts beasts from dreams beasts from legends unicorns lamassu this is an incredible experience take into account and remember the fact that man is still much smaller than we were than we are sorry man then is much smaller than we are so this would have been an incredible transformative experience what does that say about the ruler of this city that says he's rich he's powerful is he a god only the gods could have done something like this right now I'm going to show you something else and it's not from Babylon it's actually from another civilization from another region from Persepolis uh, imagine still though you're walking through the city you're going to approach a king you're going to approach someone high in power and you finally enter the building and, and lining lining the walls of this building or lining the streets of this buildings are columns again larger than life larger than what you ever can imagine I just wanted to think about that what does that say about that person 
Now a column, we take these things for granted, but someone had to invent, had to come up with an idea that is the column. Columns come in three parts. The base, the shaft, and then the capital. Here there's a really rather ornate capital. The shaft is very subdued and kind of supplemental to the base being strong enough to support everything else. And mind you, those are railroad cross ties. Railroad cross ties. Those are heavy. Those are that's no small feat. So they've created this incredibly delicate, intricate, and detailed sculpture of a bull. They've combined, you know, the abstract and the natural into one thing. Remember those two paths that we were looking at in the prehistoric chapter, the kind of abstract and the realistic. Those two practices really sort of come together here in the pattern in the plants or the flowers here, the detail in the bull's heads. I just want you to think about the time that it took because there's no DeWalt power drills, there's no scaffolding made from metal that's easy to carry. This was no small feat. And that was just to make one. Imagine a walkway, a street, a path lined with ten on each side. This was a profound work, a profound uh, presence that would make easily someone intimidated or small if they had never seen anything like it before. For visiting dignitaries, for visiting rulers, it would have been really a, a kind of a check to their power and their own, their own uh, feelings of self-worth. So you get inside the building, uh, or you're approaching the main door, and then you're greeted by this, a Lamassu, a creature of legend, a genie that is part man, part lion, part eagle. You can see the detail in the veins, the stylization, the kind of abstract stylization in the beard, the crown, the hair. And there's another shot of uh, more Lamassu. Notice, though, that here the Lamassu has both his legs, both his front legs together as if standing still. But here, one is behind the other. So you're walking by and it looks like it's walking with you. Or, let's switch that around. You first see this one before the doorways, and it looks like it's standing, but as you... I mixed it up there, I'm sorry. <laughs> as you walk by it, then you can see that it's walking. So it almost creates a double, kind of like, bringing it to life. You'd already be... You'd already have been made small, or felt to make... Made to feel small before this. But then you see this illusion, this trick in the sculpture, as if it's alive. Lamassu themselves were not just this size. There were bigger ones. And imagine a, a chamber, a, a great hall before a king, lined with these. Here the head is turned as if in judgment, waiting as a guard before you. And the king is now ready to see you. A king that has afforded multiple columns, multiple uh, bricks to be glazed and decorated, and, of course, multiple Lamassu to line the chambers and hallways before his great entrance and hall. When you look at cities like, like Babylon, like Persepolis, and, and so many others, it's, it's amazing to think about what it took and about how much time and wealth was dedicated to this. We will see the bull and bull-like figures used again in other cultures as symbols of power. We'll see it in the Aegean. We'll see it in later cultures. Even Picasso used the bull as a symbol of power. We will see lions used. The Egyptians used lions as symbols of power as well. And what I want you to remember is, in this chapter, throughout the different cultures, throughout the different uh, civilizations, you've seen this combination of stylization and naturalism. Uh, you can see it uh, in this last piece as well, in this cup. You know, an attempt to create a very realistic, uh, a very realistic animal has taken a backseat to the abstraction of the animal on the cup. Now, if you've never seen an animal like this before, let me show you. Uh, they really have magnificent horns. Uh, a popular trophy for some big game hunters. Um, but let's take a let's take a moment to look at this a little deeper. 
you have two different symbols. Here you have just the horns, you have what appear to be spears or arrows, and here you have the intact animal. But what's inside? Uh, is that water? Is that, is that a plant? What exactly is that? Is that a symbol of a house? Is it a symbol of a family? Up above, we have what appear to be, well, what could be, it could be a giraffe, it could be, I don't think they're flamingos, uh, I don't think of Florida and this, this terrain. Um, perhaps they are, you know, cranes. Uh, and then, of course, we have a dog or a fox, some long, lith creature. This could be wine. This could be for water. One's a pimp cup, one's a daily cup, who knows? We, we have more images to look from in the chapter, but these are some of the main ones. Uh, you're not going to be tested over each individual civilization. In some classes you might, but for the sake of uh, just getting a general overview, there are things that you need to understand. And if you go to the Learning Center, the student section associated with the book, it's that, uh, that website that I gave you in the syllabus. And if you have a book, uh, it's, it's the URL is on the very last page. It'll give you some key objectives. Those key terms are really important if you're looking for a kind of hoop jumping vocabulary, but there are some words that we're going to keep using. And those words that I mentioned before, I want you to understand. I want you to keep thinking about. I want you to see the connections from the prehistoric to here and to think about how convention is going to be used later on. Because I tell you, the next chapter, it's all about convention. It's all about creating a style and cementing it and letting that style spread your culture as you conquer new lands and new peoples. Load-bearing construction, this is going to be used from here on out. People still do it today. Kids still do it with their pillow forts. And, and I, I promise you, these words are not just for the chapter. The words that I mentioned before are words that you need to know. Um, so that's it for this chapter, our second, if you have any questions. I don't always ramble, I don't always get lost, I sometimes trip up, that's just the nature of it. Uh, the last time I tried to make this video, uh, my daughter needed some help with something, so I apologize. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me, uh, give me a call, drop at the office, or email me on Blackboard. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you in class.